They were talking about chip formation and CNC machining. I don't think you want me to sing. <laughs> Look at that. All I got to do is hit the table. Do you guys see this one already? Uh, yeah, yeah. Energy is the ability to work, right? Is that right? Kids need to be more dynamic, more involved. You know why you fall asleep in class? Because you're not more involved. Be more involved. Energy is the ability to do work. Power equals work over time, right? Power is work over time. Power is current times voltage. Is that true? We didn't really say that. Somebody may have said it yesterday, right? But power is current times voltage. And that's how we get that meter on the machine tool, right? That's how that meter that goes up to, what, 200%? That's how that gets its information. So we're measuring power there. Oh, so this, this video is actually kind of cool here. Oh, it's kind of got volume, right? You guys can hear the spindle? Okay. <laughs> so when it did that, we went across here. So you see there's this spindle load meter here, right? You guys notice that when you were operating the machine tools? I think on the... Uh, on the newer controllers, on the VM2 and the Super Mini Mill, it's actually just a graphical display on the controller. On the older machines, it's, it's actually a gauge. The needle moves up and down. Um, so where's that needle sitting right now? Right, it's about, so this mark right here is 50%. So it's about halfway between zero and 50%, so about 25%. And what they do here, actually, this meter goes up to I think, it, I think these go up to 200, maybe 185. So why does the meter go to 200%? Just let's get that out of the... Why, why would the meter go to 200%? Margin. Yeah, so there's a range in which it's okay to operate that spindle in a speed, right? And so, and so cause these are servo motors with servo motor controllers and stuff like that. And so when it's at 100% power here, that's sort of where it wants to be all the time. And it can go up to like 150% as long as it's doing this throughout the day. And, and you're not going to break anything. When you start getting past 150%, you get to like 180, 190, you're at risk of damaging components or make, making them wear um, prematurely. And so that's why they, uh, they'll let that spindle go up. Oh, on the other hand, it's, it's like marketing too, right? Turn the volume up to 11. Turn the power up to 200. Okay, so, so that's, that's why they do that. But so we're at 25% power here. Let's see what happens on the next pass. So what's the first thing you noticed as the tool engaged? Yeah. Uh, needle went, uh, so the needle went further up. And so what's it at? It's at like 75 or something, maybe getting close to 100% now. Um, did you notice anything else between the first pass and the second pass? Yeah, Charlie. It sounded different, right? Yeah. The, say again? Okay, yeah, it, it, it fluctuates a little bit. Right now it's sitting there close to 100%. Um, but Charlie noticed it sounded different. Was it a higher frequency or a lower frequency? It was certainly louder, right? I think the frequency was a little bit lower, but maybe about the same, but certainly louder. All right, so let's finish this pass. So 
So what do we notice here besides that it's up at 180%? Yeah, actually, before the tool engaged the material, you got one sound. As the tool starts to engage the material, you could hear the spindle slow down. All right, that's the sound of the spindle slowing down. Um, if you're running the machine tool and you hear the spindle slow down, what should you do? You could e-stop, right? You could stop the feed. What's going to happen if you stop the feed, in this situation at least? It'll stop moving into the workpiece material, right? And the spindle will speed back up. You could do that. Um, if I knew it only had a short distance left to go, I might just do nothing except look at it. Um, it's actually a thing where you add weights to the tool holder. Why would I want to add weights to the tool holder? Make the tool holder heavier than it was. Or just use a heavier tool holder, yeah, why? So it has more inertia, right, more momentum. And you call this, and, and when you're using that principle in order to get through the cut, we'll call that inertial milling. That's when we're using, it. so what, what causes, so the spindle load goes up, what's load? What's another term for load? Um, and, and so any, anybody know how they measure that, by the way? Oh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it, it's how much energy it's taking to, to do that. But what is energy? So if, if the load was higher, it took more energy. What is energy? Units. So what are the units for energy? Joules. 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 So what's a joule? It's the thing that you dig up out of the ground and you put on a ring and then you give it to your girlfriend or your boyfriend. What's a joule? Is it a watt per second? It's a, so it's got watts in it. So joules are kilogram meter squared seconds over second squared. So kilogram meter squared over. Somebody said, and, and so this is the ability to do work. So if we have energy, we are able to do work. And somebody said that it was watts per second, right? So what's a watt the measure of? Electricity. <laughs> so we do talk about watts when we measure electricity. Do we only talk about watts when we measure electricity? No, it's power. Is it, it's power, right? Oh, this one's fun. So, um, so what is power? If energy is the ability to do work, what is power? I mean, this takes power, right? But what is power? It's the rate at which we apply work. So it's the rate at which work happens. And so the units, oh, well, we've got horsepower, right? So, uh, so what is a horsepower? The power that a uh, pony can put out. <laughs> So it really came from us trying to understand power. And when they developed this unit horsepower, horses were used to pull wagons and to do all, all of the, the heavy work. So they said, well, they, they did some measurements, I guess, and they came up with this number where one horsepower is the ability to, uh, to apply 33,000 foot pounds per minute. So, so somebody made that number up. If we use our metric units, we have watts, right? And so a watt is a joule over a second. And somebody said that we were talking about energy, right? It, it said joule times, or the watt times seconds for the, the units for energy. So power is joules per second. 
And, and so that means it's kilograms meters squared over seconds squared divided by seconds, which you could reduce to kilograms meters per second times meters per second. And so what's kilograms meters per second? A force. Right, that's force. So power equals force times velocity. And so this is our relationship here. When we're looking at power in machining, it equals the cutting force, the force that it takes to make the cut times the velocity of the tool moving through the workpiece material. Now that, that's a cool piece of information for us to have because this lets us think about convert. So if we, if we have measured, so up here, right? We were able to measure how much, how much power was being used when the cut happened. Oops, I'm supposed to pause the video. It wasn't supposed to advance the slide. So here we can, we can make a measure of power. And, and so how do they make this measure of power that they're doing in the machine? What are they actually measuring here? The current. They're actually measuring current and voltage, right? And, and so they're measuring current and voltage and they're displaying it on this percentage. And, I, and we, we talked about that spindle load meter, right? And the reason that it goes to 150%. Yeah, I think I talked about that in one of the earlier classes. Uh, all right. So we've got energy, we've got power. Power equals force times velocity, right? So energy is the ability to do work. Work is force times distance. And, um, and power equals force times velocity. So this relation between power and energy. So energy is power over time. And again, in all of these instances, we want to be able to make the units work to move from, if we have one bit of information to move to the other bits of information. And yeah, see, I didn't have to go back in the slides to get to this video again, because I had it here. We're just going to skip it this time. So how do we measure power? So we measured voltage and amperage in the machine tool to measure power. How else could we measure power? We want to know how much power does it take to make a cut? What else could we measure? Anybody? Oh, maybe there's somebody talking in the chat. Um, So if we don't want to measure current in volts, what could we measure? What if we're measuring the power of a horse? We can't hook up electrodes to a horse, right? The distance? We could measure distance. It'd be better to measure the rate of distance changing, right? So can we measure velocity? What if we want to measure the horsepower at the wheels of our new muscle car? Can you use a dyno? Use like, a dyno, what's a dyno do? Uh, it's like a treadmill for cars that has resistance and measures the power. So it's like a treadmill for cars that has resistance and it measures the power. What is it? How does what if you had to build a dyno, a dyno for your car, what would you do? Um, well, you need rollers under the wheels, whether it's all wheel drive or rear wheel drive or front wheel drive. All right. So we got to have rollers under the under the wheels that are receiving power. So yep. that and, and the reason we do that is so the car doesn't move, right? Yes. Right, we want to be able to, to rotate the wheels so that the car doesn't move. And then, and then what do we do? Um, 
Well, you have a computer hooked up to the dyno that measures the forces from the wheels. Right, and the way we measure the force from the wheels is is we resist the, the force that they're outputting, right? Yeah. So we put some resistance to, to that. We measure how much resistance that we've got there. And we also measure the velocity of rotation of the wheels. Yeah. Because our force times our velocity equals power. Right. So if we did this in a, in a, in a milling machine, if we could measure the cutting force and we know the velocity, well, how do we know the velocity? Distance over time. I mean, velocity is distance over time, but but what we really care about surface speed of the cutting tool. Right. What we really care about is how fast how fast the cutting edge is moving through the workpiece material, and and somebody said it. It's the surface speed of the cutting edge, and so here we've got our cutting tool. It's moving through the workpiece material. We've got here the, so this is sort of the uncut chip thickness. This is how much material we're about to remove. This is our chip. And so this velocity, when power equals force times velocity, is the V here, that surface speed. And, and what's the force then? So what's the force? Shear force of the, to cut the material, shear force required to cut the material. Yeah, well, it's actually the, we, we actually just call it the cutting force. Um, and we, we abbreviate it FC. And it's the force that's aligned right here with this axis, with the axis of motion. So that force here in one direction. now. There, there's also, there's a tendency of the tool to want to pull out of the workpiece. So we've got a thrust force that adds together to that. We're going to talk a lot about the different forces and the force orientations tomorrow. But the, the force, the cutting force here. So how do we measure cutting force? How much the machine has to like work to cut? So we can measure power, and if we know velocity, we could try to back calculate cutting force, right? So we could measure the power of the motor, uh, but what if we wanted to directly measure the force? What could we do? If we're, we're going to study engineering science or, or manufacturing science, what would we do? If you want to measure how much force you apply to the floor every day when you walk around, what do you do? Step on a scale. We step on a scale. So could we could we put a scale somewhere in here? And maybe it would have to be a little beefier than the scale that we use in the bathroom there. So could we put a, so has anybody ever uh, built a force sensor? Has anybody in the class taken in engineering experimentation? Yep. Yeah. Did you guys build a uh, strain gauge force sensor in that class? Yeah, we did. They used, they used to do that in the lab in the class, right? You, you use a strain gauge to build a force sensor. So we could we could build a force sensor. They're actually, they make, and, and the funny thing is they call them dynamometers because the dynamometer actually is measuring force. And the, the dynamometer that we use for our car is measuring force. And then we add the velocity and, and get the power out of that. So we could use a, a cutting force dynamometer, which is this, basically it's a block that you put between either the workpiece and the, the fixture. So you fixture the workpiece on this block or you fixture the tool on this block. And it can measure, they can measure in real time, three dimensional forces. 
So it's got four sensors in three different directions. You can measure all those forces. So you could measure, you could directly measure cutting force. And again, how do we know the velocity? How do we know the velocity? It's because we chose the velocity, right? We get to set the surface speed. Now, if, um, if we have set a surface speed, let's, let's quickly go back to the video. And I wanna get up to the third pass through. All right, so we're about to do the third pass, I think. So what do you notice as it does that third pass besides the fact that the power meter goes up to 150%? It slows down. It sounds like the spindle slows down and it sounds like the spindle slowed down because the spindle slowed down. And, and so what, what that's telling us is that that cut was actually taking more power than the machine had available. And so it started slowing down and uh, in, in a, in a, Machine tool that doesn't have a lot of excess power, you hear that a lot. And as long as it doesn't slow down too much, it'll speed back up again when the tool gets out of the material. They, uh, they actually make special tool holders that have weights in them. Because if you get that weighted tool spun up really fast, it will have more resistance to slowing down as it goes through there because it's got more inertia. And so they call that inertial milling. Um, and you can do that to get a, so why do you, why would you want to get a bigger cut? If you need to remove more material, you can get through it quicker. Right. You want to be able to more quickly put chips in the bucket. So the faster you can fill buckets with chips, the, the more money you can make in your machining operation. So we want to, so we often want to do that to, uh, to get more profit. <clears throat> All right. So, so if we wanted to estimate now, all right, so now we know how we can measure the power. So we can measure the power that's going to the spindle. We could measure the powers that are going to the motors that, that, uh, that drive the different axes. And that's pretty easy because we need an amp meter and we need a volt meter. And, um, and we can actually measure the cutting forces and know the velocity so we know how to measure the power. And so for every cut that we want to make in our, in our business, we could set up an experiment and we could keep adjusting the parameters so that we maximized our, uh, we maximized our throughput and we found the best, the best combination of parameters for power and profitability or for power con conservation and ability to make the parts in time for the customers, right? So we could do those kind of things. It's expensive to do an experiment every time you want to set up a new job, right? So people aren't going to just do an experiment every time they set up a new job. So what if we wanted to estimate how much power it's going to take to make a chip in our workpiece? What are the factors that we would have to consider if we were going to estimate the, uh, the power to make a cut? So what would, uh, what would you, what would you need to consider if you wanted to estimate this? Depth of cut. All right, so we're gonna care about the depth of cut, you say? The density of the material? We're gonna care about the material. And uh, in the density probably is a factor, but there's, there's definitely bulk material properties that are gonna affect how much, how much power it takes to make a cut. What else? Is that it? Width of cut. Width of cut.
what else what else are we going to care about if we're trying to figure out how much power it's going to take to to get this chip off the workpiece material speed and speed so you say feed and speed And, and so actually, depending on which units you use for your feed and for your speed, these things together get you a volumetric material removal rate. And so the units there are, if we're using inches, it would be inches cubed per minute. So we definitely care about material removal rate. How fast you're filling the bucket with chips impacts how much power it takes. And we care about what the material is. So workpiece, material. What else do you think might impact the power? We definitely care about those things. What else impacts the power? Because that's not it. Um, who's cool ever? Sharpness. Yeah, that was my my example was going to be who's ever cut butter with a with a butter knife versus a steak knife, right? Especially frozen butter. If, if the butter is really cold, it's harder to cut it unless you have a sharp knife, right? So the sharpness of the tool. You think of anything else that might impact it? Material removal rate, how sharp the tool is, what the material is. I pressed the space bar and it brought up the screen sharing thing. That's kind of cool. I didn't know that was going to happen, but I was just about to want to share the screen. In fact, I had forgotten that I wasn't sharing the screen and I pressed the space bar because I wanted to advance the slide. All right, so um, in, in the class, we're going to have to estimate power for machining and we don't have to figure it out ourselves. And so, uh, so for example, how, do, how the material impacts it over here, that's, that's a factor that the only way to know is to cut that material. How the sharpness of the tool impacts it, the only way to know is to test a bunch of different tools with different sharpnesses. And, uh, and so people have already done those experiments. And um, this picture here shows the 28th edition of the Machinery's Handbook. And this page number is from the 28th edition of the Machinery's Handbook. Now, I think they're on 30 or 31 right now. Many editions are available to you at the, uh, the Gordon Library electronically, so you don't have to go out and buy this $100, $150 book. Um, if you're gonna work as a manufacturing engineer and you're gonna be doing a lot of metal cutting as part of your job, you're probably gonna end up owning a copy. I have one, two, I probably have six or eight different editions of it. There's not a lot of change between the editions, especially once you get past Oh, say 1950 or so. So this uh, this is fundamental knowledge that we've been gathering over years here, and I want to just go to this section. And so that wasn't the web page I wanted. Um, so this was totally the Gordon Library web page when we started today. Back. 
There it is. That was the web page it was supposed to be. All right, you guys can still see the screen, right? All right. So you go to the library web page, search for Machinery's Handbook. You don't even have to spell it correctly. You'll find a page like this. You can go to the novel mechanics link there. It'll bring you here. And you can find the section on estimating machining power. Now, in this, in this section on estimating machining power, you may have to know some information from previous sections, like about calculating speeds and feeds and things like that. <clears throat> it's all stuff you could figure out or you can go back and look it up as we go through this. But, uh, but so they've figured out, depending on the material that you have, let me see, can I make this bigger? Zoom, the zoom controls. The magic of technology. I guess that's as big as they could make it. <clears throat> so they've gone out and they've done experiments. And so depending on the material you have, and they've broken down, so there's a bunch of similar materials, so different, so cast iron, they've looked at different hardnesses for cast iron alloy cast iron um let's say you have chromoly steel um tool steels here and then on the other side there's malleable iron stainless steel zinc bronze aluminum cast rolled magnesium alloys they figured out that and oh and you can do the calculations in metric units or you can do them in the inch units they figured out that there's a constant that we can use to take into account what material we're cutting. And so for example here, if we're looking at these inch units, stainless steel, um, st stainless steel is got this constant of 0.72. Aluminum is, well, we'll say 0.25. Magnesium is 0.1. So what do we know about this then? Based on those, which material is harder to cut? Stainless steel or aluminum? Stainless steel. So let's go to participants here. So say yes, if you think stainless steel is harder to cut than aluminum. And I suppose no, if you think it's not. And this is my way of seeing how many of the 45 of you are awake. That's not too bad. 35, 38, 40 out of 45 people seem to be awake. The rest of you probably just can't reach your mouse or can't reach your keyboard from the bed. I'm assuming. Oh, 41. Somebody woke up. All right. So, so it's harder to cut stainless steel than aluminum. And I used to think that. In fact, I used to, I used to recommend people to use aluminum instead of stainless steel because, hey, aluminum is so much easier to cut. And maybe five years into making those kind of recommendations, I realized that as the, as the manufacturing engineer, it didn't matter to me which the material was. I just had to know which material I had and I could tell the software which material it was and we could use the appropriate feed speed and depth of cut. Now it does take more energy to cut stainless steel. And if you're doing it with your shoulder, so if you're using a hacksaw, it's definitely easier to cut the aluminum than it is to cut the stainless steel. But if you're using cam software in a CNC machine, it's pretty much just as easy to cut one as it is to cut the other, but one takes more energy. Um, all right, so we've got this KP factor that we have to figure out. I'm gonna write the equation on the board as we go through. So, and I know you can't see the board right now. I'll turn this, turn that on in a minute, but I've got KP. And we can look that up from the table in the machinery handbook.
Oh, and look, there's more KPs for more materials. Oh, here they give us an equation. Power of the cut equals KP times C times Q times so W. If we keep scrolling through the pages here, we'll find that C is something we call a feed factor. So C is the feed factor. Just keep going. W is the tool wear factor. So what's tool wear? Is directly related to sharpness, right? So we said the sharpness of the tool was a factor. That's taken into account with our tool wear factor, this W. E, oh wait, E wasn't in our thing, was it? We'll get back to E. Q is material removal rate. And KP is our material factor. We turn off the screen share for a second. All right, so the power of the cut is that KP factor is based on the material. It's this mysterious feed factor that we didn't consider. It's the material removal rate and it's the tool wear. And, and so all these tables in the machinery's handbook that pertain to KPs for all the different materials. And if we look at, um, I mean, material removal rate is pretty straightforward because it's just based on the geometry of the, the thing here. But if we look at our feed factors and our uh, tool wear factors, so if we look at all these factors, the way that they were developed and the reason we know them is because people did thousands of experiments with different materials and different tools and different machine tools. And they, they built these tables of factors and that happened over the past, I don't know, 50, 60 years, 70 years maybe. They've been collecting this data so that we could use it as a reference so that we could estimate the power to cut without actually having to set up our own experiment. Um, has anybody here ever done an experiment where you then use the information to develop a mathematical model? Made a mathematical model, but it wasn't really, it wasn't like from experimental data, we just had to model something using like a math program. Okay, so you've, you've guessed what the, sort of guessed what the factors were and typed them in together to figure out if you could make the units work out to model something? Essentially, yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and so that's sort of one of the first steps here is if we want to build a mathematical model and, and we build these mathematical models so that we don't have to keep doing experiments, right? It's uh, when, I, when I became a graduate student, one of the, one of the first things I, my, uh, advisor tried to teach me and, and you become a, a graduate student especially in an experimental field you do that because you like doing experiments you like discovering things right and and so you you like thinking of an experiment and then seeing if it works out um it's it's like um there's the the dilbert cartoon where the kid takes apart the x-ray machine and puts it back together better and the doctor says uh, i'm sorry to tell you but your son's going to be an engineer and, um, and, and so we, we really enjoy doing those experiments. And what my advisor kept telling me was that, uh, that a, a few hours 
at uh, or, or a few years in the lab could save you a few hours in the library. And so one of the things we want to do before we start an experiment is we want to see has somebody else already solved this problem? Has somebody done this? And, and so one of the things that they did as they were going through this is they knew just like we did, like we didn't have to do an experiment to know that the material mattered. We didn't have to do an experiment to know that the material mattered to the cut. We knew that the material removal rate mattered and we knew that how sharp the tool was, was gonna matter. And we didn't think about this C, this feed factor. And, uh, and so when you're figuring out one of these equations and you realize there's a factor that you haven't considered, you often just make up something to put in that spot. And we call it a fudge factor. And especially if you've taken a thermodynamics class or a, um, a fluid dynamics class, they, they talk about these fudge factors, these extra factors that we throw in there. And, and it's, it's a number that we realize by doing the experiment that if we always multiply by that number, it's true. And what they found out when they did these experiments was you couldn't always multiply by the same number, but that the numbers that you could multiply by were related to the feed even though we'd already captured feed in material removal rate. So we get these factors. Now that's the power. If I go back to my screen share, I should have a little button that just switches screen share on and off. That would be easier. Let me go back to my screen share and I'm gonna go back to my presentation. This one. Back to how do we measure power? How do we estimate power? I don't remember what I was about to say. It was too many steps to get back to the presentation. Let me rethink it. We got PC, we got KP, we got C, we got material removal rate, tool wear. I wanted. I wanted to have this slide. Nope, not this slide, the one before it, after it. This is the one, this is the slide I wanted. Okay, why did I want this slide? No, I got nothing. But I definitely wanted to show you this slide to make my next point. So look at this slide and figure out if there's a point there. And Emily's saying hi. Um, okay, so we can estimate power. We can use the machinery's handbook to get our factors for estimating power. Power equals force times velocity. So what are the forces? So tomorrow we're going to talk about forces and chip formation. And this, this picture that we have in front of us right now is going to be um instrumental in that discussion so what are the forces that we could have let's just think about the uh, let's for the sake of argument let's say that the chip is by itself here so let's isolate the chip and think about a free body diagram of that chip and what are the forces acting on the chip So where do the forces come from that act on this chip? The cutting tool, uh, gravity, and then the workpiece. All right, so we're gonna ignore gravity just for now. Um, and so the cutting tool, there's, there's a force this way, right? That the cutting tool is applying to the chip. Does that make sense? There's gotta be. Yeah. Now, the the chip is attached to the workpiece material but it's becoming not attached right uh let's let's wait on that so is there is there when the chip slides along this rake face of the tool here could you imagine that that the tool is pushing the chip this way there's friction between the two 
and there's a force of friction that's got to be lined up with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, hi, sweetie. Oh, you got Sir Panda Face in the video. Yeah, they're watching the screen, though. So if you want to have Sir Panda Face, we'll have to shut off the screen sharing. Sorry. They can't really see you. you. If you talk, they can hear you, but they can't see you. Hello. Uh, this is the happy child. It's nice that there's a happy child. So there's got to be a there's got to be a force lined up because of the friction here. There's got to be a force that that is trying to keep the chip attached to the workpiece material. So there's a force that lines up with the shear plane here, where the chip is becoming chip and stops being that. And, um, and so all of these forces at, can add together into, uh, into what we call an orthogonal force system. And so if I, let's see if I select, but not show that one right now, not show that one right now, and then draw. So you can, you can align all these forces like this. And so there's, we call this the cutting force. Let's see if I get text, oh wow, this is cool, FC. And we call this one FT. And so there's gotta be a force from friction and there's a normal force to that friction. Those two, the force, the force from friction that acts along so the force from friction that's going to act along here there has to be a normal force right and so that normal force and the friction force have to add together to the same resultant force as this thrust force and cutting force so let's draw our resultant force uh, i always draw this so that it looks like it's aligned with the uh the plane there and it's not intentional. Let me shorten, if I shorten the cutting force. And we can change the cutting force all we want when we're using paper and pencil here. All right, so if our FT is like this, or FC is like that, then we've got this resultant force. And so the friction force and the normal to the friction force have to add together to the same resultant force. The shear force and the force normal to the shear force have to add together to the same resultant force. Because there's only one true resultant force that's acting on the chip. And so we're gonna spend some time tomorrow going through the different geometric relationships here so we can transform from one force system to the other and to try to understand that. And we're going to be looking, I've got some models of the, uh, of the chip formation that I usually pass around the classroom. So I will hold it up to the camera. And next time we make one of these, next time we make one of these kits that we send out, I'm going to include a little 3D printed model of the chip formation thing. Because I think, you know, oh, we can make keychains out of them too. I think they're really cool. And it really helps you visualize what's going on when we do this. So tomorrow we're going to talk about the chip forming on the edge of the tool. And we're going to concentrate on the forces that are happening as that chip forms on the edge of the tool. Um, and then on Thursday, we're going to talk about why that's really important to us when we're designing fixtures and when we're, we're trying to make sure that things don't fly apart um, as we're... Uh, cutting the work pieces. Um, group project. <clears throat> Just a quick overview of what the group project is. We'll go into a little bit more detail tomorrow. But uh, there's going to be a set of 10 problem statements. And for each of the 10 problem statements, you and your group will make a mathematical model that solves that problem. 
we're gonna and and we've got pretty specific format we want you to present that in. We give you an Excel file that that you start with. We want you to fill that out. So that that group project again is going to be due a week from this coming Friday, and we'll get more details about that tomorrow. But the group project is going to be to model these things so that if you ever see the question again, perhaps in a quiz or a final exam, you can just plug the numbers into the model. You don't have to figure it out every time you see that question. Um, and for that matter, there are some, some of these calculators and models available on the internet. Stop annotating. Um, one of them we see, I can stop annotating, but it doesn't make the annotations go away. But uh, this, this uh, website, Carbide Depot, which they sell cutting tools, they've got some great models and calculators that you might find useful as you're going through the class. But if you're converting from RPM, um, things like that, you can do that. If you want material removal rate, you can plug in the numbers and get that. So there's lots of these models out there on the internet. Um, I often will open a spree and I'll type in the surface speed and it will tell me the RPM as long as I've got the tool to find correctly. So there's a lot of different ways to, uh, to get this information, but we're gonna have you for your assignment, build some models to answer these kind of questions. And we're gonna use Excel for that. Um, do you guys have any questions before we go? Everybody's quiet today. Is there a discussion question or? There's two discussion questions. They're, they're already posted there in the assignments thing in Canvas. Um, the first one, oh, I don't remember the order of them. I can go to Canvas and look at it. Canvas. Hundred. The internet's a little bit slow this morning. The first question is what factors determine cutting forces in machining? And why do we care? The second question is why do we care about estimating cutting forces and power in machining operations? And some of you maybe have already answered those questions. I posted them over the weekend. <clears throat> um, anything else? All right, outstanding. I will see everybody tomorrow at 11. Um, yeah, it's disappointing. This is the week that normally I would throw candy at you. So if you've got some candy, have it handy, um, you know, at your desk area, at your workstation tomorrow. And, and the rules for getting and and I, I would say I throw candy to you, but I'm not that good at throwing. So I really am throwing candy at you at that moment. But, um, but the rules for the candy were, if you answer a question out loud, you get a piece of candy on the first day. On the second day, I have to believe that your answer was correct. And on the third day, if there's still any candy left, I have to believe that your answer is correct and that the question was valuable. Because sometimes I ask stupid questions. Um, yeah, so have some candy ready tomorrow or some toast. I, I don't care, but treat yourself to something when you ask a question. And I don't know. Post a picture of it, post a selfie of you eating candy or something. I don't know. It's kind of disappointing for me. I do notice that energy tends to fall off this week in the class. Um, it's because everybody's got a lot of stuff to do. The term's catching up with us. So I get it. So try to do something to stay excited, to stay energized, jump up and down, stand against the wall, do some push ups, and see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.